Welcome to Climate Story. We live in a time where material progress often comes at a great cost and threatens the very fabric of our existence. Dr. Julian Bayless is among the most dynamic and authentic voices in the fight for nature and wildlife ecosystems. A few years ago, he discovered a rainforest that hadn't had a human visitor in potentially hundreds of years. Dr. Bayless says the objective of the discovery was to measure the impact of man-made climate change, which is accelerating at an unprecedented pace. Mass extinction that we are experiencing now is, is probably quite fundamentally from just straightforward habitat destruction in the first instance and then climate change in the second instance. Climate change is occurring so fast that basically, you know, biodiversity cannot adapt quick enough. I'm Rishad Mehta, and this is a new podcast by Climate Story, featuring the most important voices in climate science, sustainability, conservation, and entrepreneurship. Today's guest is Dr. Julian Bayliss, one of the UK's foremost ecologists and subject of the National Geographic documentary, The Lost Forest. This wide-ranging interview is split into five chapters for easy listening. In chapter one, Dr. Bayliss shares his early influences and his introduction to conservation in Africa. In chapter two, we learn about two of his most famous discoveries, the rainforest of Mount Mabu and an Inselberg called Mount Liko. Chapter three covers the ground realities of working in Africa, including corruption, wildlife crime, and poaching. Chapter four is a deep dive into the climate effects on native species and the mass extinctions the planet is experiencing. And finally, Chapter 5 talks about hope and what we can do to get more involved with the protection of these areas and species. I spoke to Julian at his home in Wales to get a glimpse of the magical world that he inhabits. Chapter 1. Early Influences and Discovering Africa. It's a pleasure to be here in your beautiful home. (laughs) Thank you for coming, Richard. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you. What's your earliest memory of being in awe of nature? Well, I actually started... Uh, pretty much where we are where we are today. I was born in Cardiff and then my mum and dad moved up to North Wales and bought a an old farmhouse on a mountain in Wales and the man they bought a farmhouse off was running a moth trap for Roth Hampstead Insect Survey recording moths in the area and he left the moth trap and it was a permanent fixture in the garden in those days. Um, there wasn't much to do on a mountain in, in Wales. Entertainment was a little bit limited, shall we say. So I turned on the moth trap and, and I started at the age of seven collecting moths. And that really started a fascination in Lepidoptera, which is the study of butterflies and moths, and the moths led on to butterflies. And uh, there was an old man called Mr Newstead who smoked a pipe and uh, he drove a black Morris Minor. And he was a local moth expert and my mum and dad contacted him and then he used to come up and he used to smoke his pipe and we used to watch and see what was going to come in on the sheets. That's really beautiful. So from the time you were seven till you finally went to university, how did you develop in your understanding of nature and how did you start like thinking of it as a career? Well, I think between, I don't know, between the ages of seven and, and my early 20s, I guess, I wanted to, you know, learn more about plants and animals in Britain and across the world, prevent the destruction of the natural world. I wanted to save the rainforest. Um, One of the books that my parents bought me when I was younger, much younger, was a a book um, called Butterflies, I think, by Robert Gooden from Worldwide Butterflies. And in there, halfway through the book, there is a watercolor picture, an image of a man with a butterfly net in a rainforest. And you see shafts of sunlight and this three-dimensional structure of the rainforest and, and obviously the butterflies all flying throughout the forest and stuff like that. And that, um, that was a little bit like a sort of dream image where, you know, at a very young age, before the age of 10, I thought, I want to go and do that. I want to experience that. I want to see that with my own eyes. I went to Africa the first time, I think at the age of 18, um, when I did some voluntary work. Uh, and I ended up on a, on a school just on the edge of outside Soweto, um, teaching maths and general science to street kids and ex-detainee kids, orphans. Um, And then in in the school holidays, we got to travel Southern Africa. We were hitchhiking, sometimes sleeping by the sides of the road, sometimes in tents and on junctions and stuff like that. 
in those days it seemed you know fairly doable i don't know what it's been like these days um and that's opened up the world of africa which is uh which is something that people often say well you'll never get out of your blood the first time you you visited africa when you were teaching there was was there a significant culture shock or did you feel very much at home <laughs> there was a huge culture shock it was south africa and it was during apartheid years and this is uh 1989 and then outside the rest of south africa was also you know very different and very different to it is now um so so yes there was there was a culture shock yes i mean but we we loved it and we had a great time got into all sorts of trouble but uh but it was a learning curve in at the deep end uh, as often the best way to learn and certainly that traveling that hitchhiking around southern africa and we went everywhere we went uh, all across zimbabwe and zambia botswana at the time over to um, namibia which was just changing hands from south Af- southwest africa to namibia in those days um and then down through mozambique uh, across down through malawi uh, i was up on mount malangi the age of 18 which is southern africa's second highest mountain and little known to myself that you know 20 years later i'd be living there for 6 years working as the ecologist on on that mountain and i'm assuming off to you spent those couple of months there you you returned to Wales to return to your university well this is before university this was a whole year that we spent in in South Africa so then i came back and yeah then then went to university after that and did a first degree in zoology and uh, we did expeditions and each expedition was about 3 months long uh, we had a week either side to pack and unpack so we were in the forest for something like 6 weeks at a time so they were very long expeditions Um and I did that for three and a half years so I did nine three month expeditions pretty much back to back which was quite intense by the end of it I wasn't very well at the end of it um, I had malaria something like 14 15 times and and uh dysentery a few times and various other bits and pieces <laughs> but uh, I survived and uh, but that was a great learning experience in terms of working in rainforest environments and organizing and running expeditions At the time what were the goals of these these expeditions was it to discover new species or study the rainforest themselves well these were baseline surveys so yeah finding new species is always part of it um but really it was sort of finding out documenting what was there making an inventory um in terms of numbers and diversity of the plants and the animals which is important it's it is baseline stuff but you need to know that in order to drive management prescriptions and management initiatives and management plans i mean you can't manage a place if you don't know what's there uh you can't manage a place if you don't know how important various plants and animals in there and and also you can't manage a place if you, if you don't know how many of those species are only found there and nowhere else in the world there is a reason and a purpose for finding new species they can help rank the importance of that particular site When you say a species is endemic, it's endemic that means that it's only found in that one place or you have near endemic where it's maybe found in two places. And finding new species that are only found in one place, raising the levels of endemism, uh promotes the importance of that site which which then opens the door to greater funding opportunities and greater management opportunities. And so in other words that site then goes higher up the the list of of sites which need to be saved with the limited resources that are available in the conservation world there's an organization a conservation organization famous one's been going for a very long time now called the IUCN and they host something known as the the red list or the red list of endangered threatened near threatened vulnerable species across the world and they are the central database for rare endangered and also extinct animals there was a list with which ones have gone extinct at the time when you spent your first you know couple of years in africa was there a significant culture gap between you and the other people on the expedition and how did you sort of work around that what i've always found about africa is that uh, africans are always very friendly people um, and you can also have a laugh and have a good joke with them i mean they, they understand your jokes and you understand their jokes which is quite nice There is that connection which is important. I'm Rashad Mehta and this is our climate story. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and stay in touch.
Chapter 2 Discovering New Worlds You've used Google Earth quite famously to discover new areas and, and new rainforests. Can you tell us about the Mount Mabu discovery? Was that in 2012? No, Mount Mabu was 2005. So I was working on, on Mount Mulanji in, in southern Malawi as the ecologist, which has a lot of uh, endemic plants and animals. It's a huge mountain. It's the second highest mountain in southern Africa. It goes up to 3,000 meters and has a has a plateau, a 2,000 meter plateau. Um, the whole area covers something like 450 uh, kilometers squared. So it and 16 to 20 peaks on it. Anyway, from from the high altitude plateau of Mount Malangi, because it sits on the border of northern Mozambique, you can look across northern Mozambique and see all these other mountains um, that are big and equal. Um, that rise above 1,500 meters. So the question arose in those days, around about 2004, what degree of similarity do these mountains in northern Mozambique have with Mount Melange? I mean, what levels of endemism do they share? You know, do they share the same species just between these mountains and nowhere else in the world? And that sparked a new project uh, funded by the British government through a Darwin Initiative grant to look at a um, three-year program to survey, to run scientific expeditions on a selection of these mountains. I think we chose six six mountains in northern Mozambique across the border, closest to Mount Melange, above 1,500 metres. So my job, uh, I helped write the proposal and the first draft of all of that, and then I, I organised the expeditions and chose chose all the sites. Mount Marble was one of those. We knew the mountain was there, um, but the forest was relatively unknown at that point. Obviously, the local people knew it, we only discovered this to the international uh, community, not to the national, not to the local people. They'd been in and out of the forest and using it for a very long time. On the first visit in 2005, we tried to, we went through a derelict tea estate that was at, at the base. It'd been derelict since the war. There'd been a lot of fighting in this area. Renamo, uh, which was the opposition to the Frelimo, which is the current government, had been very active in this area and there'd been a lot of fighting. And so the local people are actually using the forest as a refuge during the during the war, which also helped protect it, maybe. On the first visit, we tried to climb the mountain from the wrong side, the steeper side. We got about three quarters of the way up, ran out of water, and we're about to turn up, turn back. And then we just turned the shoulder of the mountain. I could see a glimpse of the forest just stretching as far as you could see into the eventual horizon. Very exciting. And uh, so we, we came back down. And the next day, we went we went around the base of the mountain to try and get to the forest and we got into it um, and that was really the first visit to Marble Forest and that was in 2005 and then after that we then got out all the satellite imagery and started looking up the forest and seeing because essentially we had uh, done a ground truthing exercise we had identified and determined that this was medium altitude rainforest wet forest and then looking on the satellite maps including Google Earth we were then calculated the extent and the size of this forest, which then turned out to be um, the largest rainforest or the largest medium altitude rainforest in Southern Africa. And that then sparked a wave of media interest and a, and, a, and a series of scientific expeditions. And in 2008, the story was released, I think through the Kew Press Office, Royal Botanic Gardens Kew, who are the British organization coordinating in collaboration with uh, Melange Mountain Conservation Trust and the Department of Agriculture and the Herbarium in, in Maputo in Mozambique. They released the story of, it, of its discovery to the international community. And um, as a result of that, um, it went viral and ended up in, in most news channels and most newspapers across the world. And that worked in the favor of Mount Marbu. And all these years later, as a result of that, um, and a result of the media attention and the focus and uh, the identification, Mozambique is very, I think, proud of, of, of Marbu Forest and having it, having the largest rainforest in Southern Africa. And here we are today, uh, almost 20 years later, turning it into uh, or creating Mozambique's newest protected area. So that's really quite significant as well. Um, and it's an interaction between geology, it's an interaction between isolation, climate, and it's an interaction with the biodiversity and the endemic species. So it's all of these factors combined that is generating the evidence base towards a new eco-region for Africa. And at, and at what point did you discover Mount Liko? 
in 2012, again, when I was looking at the satellite imagery, I saw this, this strange, very sort of dark green patch of forest isolated on the top of, of, of this crater-like mountain and the forest was inside the crater in like a basin. It looked like a volcano, but it's not a volcano. It's that, but it's that sort of shape. I saw that and I noted it down in 2012 and said at some point I must go there and have a look at that because the surrounding land was all heavily cultivated and disturbed. You could see the crop fields and everything else all around it. But this, this is, then you had this huge dark green intact basin of forest. So why was that? I mean, there can only be two two answers to that. One is it's inaccessible and you can't get there. Um, or it's a spiritual site and they leave it alone. In about 2017, I finally found the, the window and the time to, to get a vehicle and, and try and recce the site. And and I'd just done that and I just bought myself a new drone, which I'd only flown about once or twice. And uh, we managed to get to the base of Mount Lico and you couldn't see the forest. It's hidden because it's in the base and the crater up above and the, and the sides are steep and sheer and uh, vertical. So I flew the drone up and over and with my limited drone flying skills. And indeed, I could see the imagery on my phone of the drone taking the video footage and actually showing the forest for the first time ever, confirming the fact that that, that they had wet forest a wet forest basin. And that was tremendously exciting. Um, but then as I flew the drone further over the crater edge, I, I lost direct line of sight between my controller and the drone. And of course... Uh, once that happens, then uh, then your drone becomes. Yeah, you know, I got this error message flashing up. Your drone is lost. I was like, oh, no, <laughs> I've just come all this way and spent all this money on a drone only to just lose it on the pretty much the first flight. But luckily, these are these are clever pieces of kit these days. And and what happens when that if you lose the connection with the controller, it automatically stops, turns around, comes back, and sort of lands by itself. And that's pretty much what happened. After that, we looked at the imagery on the computer of the high res. We saw the forest, and that was really then the start of, OK, now I must get an expedition to go and have a look at this place. It was only a very small patch of forest, literally a kilometre across. Um, but you never know, there might have been some new stuff in it. So, uh, And the exciting part to that was really sort of the rock climbing element, the international team. I organised a huge team of international scientists in every taxonomic group. Uh, it was quite large, maybe too large in that sense. Difficult to manage, but we, we made it in the end. It was a successful expedition. And we got up into the forest, and then the film crew came as well um, from Grain Media. And Grain Media, a very incredible um, outfit. Um, they've made some amazing documentaries. Anyway, and then they, they made a film, and then it was sold to Ge National Geographic. That expedition was good because it highlighted the northern Mozambique mountains and the forest patches and the conservation work. So it was good for putting these mountains, the rest of the mountains, on the maps. But a lot of these sites are highly threatened. Very few are protected even now. Um, and a lot of these forests are so small that, unfortunately, a lot of the new species, species new to science that we found in them will be lost before we get round to possibly protecting them, which is a great shame. Climate change is another factor. What you find with climate change is often species that are evolved to live a lifestyle, a life history towards the top of these mountains or the top of the forest. Then as the climate changes get pushed out, they've got nowhere to go to. They can't go higher than the top of the mountain. They can't go above the top of the forest line. Um, but they don't live below. They've evolved to live at the high altitude forests or the high altitude uh, grasslands and stuff like that. So... That's what happens when climate change occurs and occurs at such a speed that species don't have time to evolve, to adapt to it. What were your big takeaways from the Mount Lico expedition? Well, we discovered some new species. Um, I discovered a new butterfly there. There's uh, hopefully a new species of frog. We've got some new crabs and stuff. The Lico expedition generated a fair amount of media interest, as did the Marbu um, discovery to the international community uh, about 10 years before then. And in a way, the importance of these expeditions through the media are to try and highlight these northern Mozambique mountains to help, you know, generate some sort of conservation focus, which has worked, actually. I'm now part of a consortium made up of three or four main Mozambican organizations. I'm the science 
conservation advisor on it, to turn Marbu Forest, which uh, turned out to be the largest medium altitude rainforest in southern Africa, into Mozambique's newest protected area. And that's almost a 20 year journey now. And this is the last part of, of what will be just over a 20 year journey, commitment, involvement from my side. And an absolute privilege and a pleasure to be part of a consortium led by Mozambique and Mozambican organizations to create a new protected area for Mozambique, which is coming on the back of all of the scientific expeditions, the discoveries, the new species, the species news to science that we found there, and also the media focus and the media attention over the years has raised this site to such a high profile that we've now been we now been given a mandate by the Mozambican government to to create a new protected area. You know, so that's that's an example of how it can work, and hopefully will be a conservation success story. Um, we're working closely with local communities to do this, and hopefully it'll be a form of community conservation area, because the local communities have looked after the forest some uh, with support and, and some funding and, you know, other various inputs, investments, a bit of nature-based tourism, a visitor centre maybe, um, and turn the hunters into guides. Um, the hunters are the best people to employ when you're in a, in a rainforest environment. Um, they know the forest better than anybody. Uh, there's, there's often very few paths in a forest, and if you go off path, it can be very disorientating and it'd be very easy to get lost. Uh, the three-dimensional structure of a of a rainforest is such that um, if you sort of go off the path and you know do a few 360s, it's quite possible you will have no idea which direction you've just come from. And even so, even more so if the light is fading and it's starting to get dark, so it's very easy to get lost. Uh, local hunters know can read the forest, you know, like a back garden. They know it very well, and so they are excellent guides and they're excellent people to use as guides. But also they, they know where all the traps are because they set them, and they know the signs for the traps. And often these traps are underneath the ground, and they can be platform traps with, with a set of teeth either side that are then close to within millimeters. And the momentum or the spring behind all of that can be, you know, something like a bent over car leaf spring or something like that you know the, it it can be a huge force and if you get a step on one of those you could well certainly lose your your foot so yeah so that's that's all happening now for marbu forest in northern mozambique we're in the process of creating a new protected area a community conservation area and uh, so for the benefit of all really for the benefit of of livelihoods and the benefit of uh, conservation for the benefit of saving you know the species new to science that we found there and all the other species The Climate Story Podcast is a deep dive into the most interesting people in climate science, conservation, and sustainability. Now we move on to Chapter 3, The Challenge of Africa. When you work with these local governments in Africa, I think the stereotype is that there is a high degree of corruption, and is that something you've experienced? It's a bit of a mixed bag, to be honest. There's a lot of corruption. Uh, there's a lot of people just ticking boxes. There's a lot of people saying what, you know, they think you want to hear. There's a lot of playing of donors and things like that. That all happens. However, uh, there are dedicated and good people involved as well. There are people who want, you know, in the in the host countries who want to save and protect and conserve for future generations. And so I think you just go forward, really, and and. You work. It's you find the people who are dedicated over time, and you work with them. Um, you understand and you recognise there are various issues and various other things at play. Um, there is certainly corruption, and you recognise that, and you try and work around that. At the end of the day, it's all about impact. It's all about delivery. It's all about a successful conservation project and I think you've got to keep that in your mind in terms of that is the most important thing that this site is protected that this these plants and animals are protected um, the area isn't being destroyed the local communities have livelihoods 
um, and you're aiming to work for some form of dynamic equilibrium of harmony of sustainable conservation between you know uh, an area being protected and the habitat not being destroyed and, and the species not being threatened or removed you've got to tread accordingly and lightly and around and 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 you certainly it's not quite as simple as as conservation there is a political game as well which you have to try and and figure your way through but um there are enough people i find anyway the dedicated people that you can work with and uh yeah at the end of the day it's all about delivery really i mean at the end of the day it's all about saving these places so if you can achieve that then you know that's 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 a success do the governments actually feel like saving these places would be of material benefit to the people living there because technically if an area is protected that means people can't hunt or can't cut down trees for wood like what's what's their incentive to protect these areas you know the host governments have a huge role to play in this and they need to recognize this um that i find there's a lot of talk there's a lot of reports the situation is known the solutions are and the recommendations are given but then it's all about acting on these 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 recommendations and um you often find people talk the talk but you know they don't walk the walk resource extraction which covers the the points that you raised is all about thresholds and so you can have inside a protected area you can have a usage area and a non-usage area so you can have a core area for biodiversity where you you should where there can be no hunting or cutting of trees and then also you can have a a buffer area or or a usage area where levels of extraction can be agreed upon in terms of hunting in terms of you know removal of some some limited timbers maybe and wild product collection and stuff like that and and that is a a scenario that is agreed through a lot of discussion a lot of community led meetings at the end of the day you need the communities to honor um these levels of extraction and the areas which um can be can be acceptable and the areas that it can't be acceptable so we we would try and put a buffer area around a core conservation area and inside that buffer area we would we would uh try and establish a range of investments or um, initiatives where people can can have what they need for their livelihood so these would be alternative sustainable livelihoods you you could you can sometimes swap you know um hunting of bush meat for certain livestock like pigs or chickens or something like that you can you can supplement you can help with conservation agriculture so they don't need to uh continue look for uh nutrient rich soil um you can plant trees on wood lots so they have wood to use as building poles and some trees can be grow faster than others such as blue gums um you know in an area of land outside of a forest area then that could can work quite nicely and can provide a supply of the necessary building materials quite quickly uh bamboo is coming through in africa quite strongly these days which is quite interesting it's been around in the asian market obviously for a very long time but in africa it hasn't really traditionally been used one of the greatest threats to the woodlands in africa not the wet forest but the woodlands is charcoal and the and the um the use of charcoal um for cooking and it's the desired fuel by a lot of urban and rural communities and it's extremely destructive because i think it, you know, you need seven bags of wood to make one bag of charcoal um and the best charcoal has traditionally been from the 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 hardwoods found in the in the miombo woodlands and so these woodlands are being absolutely destroyed and a lot of them have already have and have and vast areas across uh east and southern africa have been completely destroyed and cleared uh just for charcoal so people can cook uh and the future projections are also not good so for example you know the dynamic is still in east and southern africa or certainly in in the areas i've been working at that 80 or 90% of your local community still lives in a rural environment and takes directly from the natural resources 
Well, if, if that population is going to double in the next 20 years, and already the natural resources are completely depleted in terms of cooking, I'm talking about fuel wood here, from the areas outside forest reserves and national parks, essentially protected areas now, even now, today as we speak, the forest reserves and, and to you know, a lesser extent the national parks are being destroyed in terms of the trees taken just so people can cook. If the population doubles in the next 20 years, I mean, we're, we're already at a crisis stage now. So alternatives need to be fine, found and um, alternatives need to be given to local communities so they can, they, can, they can use something else to cook with. Africa is obviously a super resource-rich continent. Is there a lot of interference from foreign governments in terms of uh, mining rare earth elements you know that that power our mobile phones and a lot of the technology that we use is, is there a growing presence there is there a growing shadow there of of other governments coming in to, to sort of eat africa's lunch yeah for sure i mean this is this is nothing new there is it i mean in, during the colonial period then then africa's resources were extracted and shipped to the west of the European countries. Um, now, post-colonial, you, you're seeing more of uh, the same sort of thing happening, but going to the Asian or the Eastern markets, deals are made and and resources are, are taken and extracted. It's difficult. I mean, whether, whether or not, you know, the money that's paid sits within the government or in the pockets of the people in the government um, or goes down to the better of the country and the better of the people, probably more the former than the latter, Africa's resources are still being extracted and taken out of Africa and probably the people of Africa are not benefiting as they should. Uh, the hardwoods, the blackwoods, that's all being shipped out. The seas that are being fished, uh, the coastal areas are being taken, minerals are being extracted, uh, mining companies are there. Whether or not that's done with environmental standards or not uh, depends on the uh, the project in question but uh, yeah that is all happening <laughs> a few years ago you were like a expert witness to wildlife crime that was taking place in malawi is that is that an example of a, a foreign government or is it a private company that was illegally cutting down the forest there well that's quite an interesting case so this was turned out to be, at the time, Malawi's largest wildlife crime field arrest case in its history. I was employed by the government as a technical advisor for biodiversity and protected area management. And one of the national parks, Lengue National Park in southern Malawi, there was a, an extension area to this park that was largely inaccessible and very few roads. And as a result, uh, the park staff didn't get there very often. But then news came through the local communities of this large logging operation that was happening that was coming over from Mo Mozambique. And so the park staff decided to try and go and have a look and, and make an arrest. And then they were, the people were tipped off and they ran away. So a month or so later, they then tried again and they, they caught uh, a huge logging operation, which was 35 people. And it was commercial. And they were taking, them, taking Mapani, which is a type of blackwood, a bit like... Um, Ebony, a bit like Dalbergia, but they they have all now been taken. So Mapani is, is looks very similar, but it's a bit more brittle. Anyway, they had driven huge roads in from the Mozambican side with road graders and earth movers. They had a fleet of four-wheel drive, modern tractors, thirty-five people with chainsaws. They had thirty-ton flatbed lorries. They had caterpillar earth movers caterpillar forklift trucks to load all of the wood they had probably been working there for at least a year and so we arrested them and then um, it looks like there were two outfits working there the bosses came over because they were the arrest was made about midnight and they heard about this they actually drove in and tried to bribe the game guards who had arrested them uh, who then arrested the bosses and there were a number of Chinese and uh, a Portuguese man and they were in charge of the logging teams. And I don't think they were the same organization. I think there were two different outfits that we arrested that night. One was Chinese and one was Portuguese. So this whole convoy of arrested people and illegal vehicles took two days to get from the arrest site back to the park headquarters. And then all hell broke loose um, 
because then the news got out and the news also got back to Mozambique and, and the bosses of the bosses heard, you know, that, the, that they had been arrested and, and everything else. And then all sorts of bribery and corruption was going on. And we had to move fast throughout the courts to try and get it moved from one magistrate's court to another magistrate's court because the, there was elements of um, corruption and bribery going on for the for a quick release. And eventually it ended up in the High Court and then the Supreme Court. And um, our, my role, as a, I was a state witness. Uh, my doctorate was in uh, geographical information systems. So I was looking at the satellite imagery and we questioned them and said, you know, when did you start this? Well, we started this, let's say, in March of that year. So then I took the satellite imagery from before then because then we had on record when they said they came. Um, and then we... That using the satellite imagery, you can actually look at the area of woodland or forest, if you like, uh, that existed before and then had been removed over the six months of which they were operating, for example. They've probably been there many years, to be honest, but um, they gave us a, a, a moment in time, a baseline, which we could then use for comparison of before and after. And as a result of that, we were then able to calculate how much area had been removed and they were looking at the Mapani trees and we'd be able to calculate, you know, what was the stocking density of mature palm, Mapani trees for this part of Africa in this area of land. And then we could actually calculate approximately how many Mapani trees that they had removed. And uh, they had probably removed something like half a million, but they were charged with 250,000. And, and the satellite imagery was able to prove that because they had actually said when they were first set up and started that. So I, that was my job. I was part of the state prosecution. The, the court case went for seven months, something like 30 odd court appearances. And eventually they were sentenced to all of them to three years, um, including the Chinese and the Portuguese boss. So that was a success. And that was uh, Malawi's largest field arrest court case in its history at the time. But what's quite interesting is the value of money behind all of this. So if you look at, for example, rhino horn or elephant uh, ivory, whatever, a tusk or a horn is something like $250,000, let's say, for example. Each Mapani tree is something like £15 per cubic metre at source. So if you get two cubic metres per tree, which is about right, it's about £30 a tree. So if you had a million of these trees, that'd be $30 million or oh, £30 million. So you were looking at something in the region of seven and a half to £15 million worth of wood that they had extracted. So pretty high, high value. So when you think of wildlife crime, you normally associate it with animals and pangolins and, and rhinos and, and, and uh, elephants, and rightly so. But uh, the timber side of it is also very big and very lucrative who pays a quarter of a million dollars for a for a rhino horn i mean what's the benefit there what's the value there well the rhino horn i, th I think it's well documented it goes to the the asian markets where it's, it's a medicinal part of chinese medicine where it's ground up and given i think of the rhino horn is supposed to cure everything although it's it's just keratin and, and it's no different to your fingernail there's absolutely zero scientific basis, and if, if it's analysed in a lab, it'll it'll just come out as the same as your fingernail, because of its how rare it is. Then, um, then its value is so high. I'm Rashad Mehta, and this is Climate Story today with Dr. Julian Bayless. Chapter four: Climate change and mass extinction. Today, when we when we think about climate change in the general conversation conservation is not you know it's not on top of the list yeah i mean basically everything is really connected in some way or another which we are finding out to our detriment now in the sense that we may have thought that you know our species or whatever is somehow disconnected from nature in this day and age and we're above it or, or separated from it and our our technologies and our lifestyles mean that we don't have this this dependence on nature that we may have had in the past, but that's not true at all. Most of the developing world has a direct dependence on nature and takes directly from the natural resources. We in in the should we in the so-called developed world, we look around ourselves with, in our cities and our cars and everything else, and and and, and it's understandable that may, maybe or we may think, and a younger generation or whatever may think that that we are not as dependent on nature that we used to be. But what's very interesting in this latest pandemic 
Um, within the first few months, we saw, you know, a shutdown of society in, in that sense. You know, all the planes stopped flying and, and movement was restricted and things became, you know, on the supermarket, uh, things were going off the shelves, you know, including toilet paper. What was interesting was just how quickly that happened. And so I think things can break down very quickly and we don't realize just maybe how quickly and, and how dependent we are on the natural world. And I think it was a good wake-up call. I think uh, the, that pandemic made people think again about nature and maybe made people think again about our connection with the natural world and also made people think again about our dependency and how we affect the natural world. And that coupled with everything that's happening, happening with climate change. So in terms of conservation, conservation is there in uh, climate discussions. Um, if you want to reduce or stop climate change from increasing or accelerating, then you have to conserve the various natural areas that are being destroyed that are, that are promoting this. For example, the rainforests. Um, if we if we stop cutting down the rainforests, then then they will help balance the atmosphere that we breathe and we live in, uh, and certainly the the amount of CO two that's that's in the atmosphere. Conservation is part of that, and it's integral to climate change. You might not hear the word conservation, but measures to address climate change will be conservation measures. So there's been a lot of talk on on certain media channels about a sixth mass extinction and certain estimates say that 40% of wildlife will be wiped out by the end of the century. Is that something that you're seeing in your work? And is that something that you've seen over the last 30 years of, of, of visiting these, these rainforests? Yes. Yes, I have seen it. So this is the Anthropocene. So the, um, essentially we as a human race are increasing uh, in population so fast um, and destroying the natural resources so quick that the balance is changing too fast for the natural world to evolve and keep up with and, and, and even more directly than that the habitats in which you know certain rare threatened endemic or species occur are just simply being removed destroyed so they have no chance to even uh, adapt because they've got nowhere to go to and I've seen that in some of the uh, work I've been doing in, in East and Southern Africa. We find a lot of new species to science, species new to science that are in these pockets of montane wet forest or rainforest on these, these isolated mountains in northern Mozambique and southern Malawi. The threats to these forests, they're being cut down, not necessarily for commercial logging, but for more sort of shifting agricultural practices where people are just looking for, for good quality soil to, to plant crops in. And, you know, you can't blame them for that. Um, and, and the answer is some form of conservation agriculture where they can do that without having to cut down the forest to find the soil, you know, the good nutrient soil. But I've seen these, some of these patches of forest are so small that um, some of the endemic species, for example, little pygmy chameleons found in, in patches of forest that are just a couple of hectares big, uh, have gone and uh, the forests have gone and we've gone down to maybe one hectare or, or even less and so these are you know species of vertebrates uh, that are becoming extinct within the time frame that I've been working there from first finding them in in round about 2006 7 8 to to now so what's that so less than 20 years um, I've seen whole areas of forest removed that contained just endemic species found nowhere else in the world. So I've been presuming as a result of that, because they're forest dependent, that these species have now gone. And is that causing this mass extinction that... I think the mass extinction, the Anthropocene that we're experiencing now is, uh, certainly climate change has, uh, is a large part of that, uh, but I think it's more fundamental than that. I think it's just straightforward habitat destruction the clear felling of wet forests for uh, monocrop uh, cultures such as uh, palm oil. Uh, even soya. Soya is one of the largest drivers of rainforest destruction. And everybody thinks it's something that's, you know, quite a green thing. It's not. It's, it's, it's a huge driver of rainforest destruction. Uh, we all know about cattle and farming. 
um, and beef. Palm oil seems to be in everything. Uh, you try and buy a bar of soap in a supermarket uh, with doesn't have palm oil in, it's almost impossible. I think that the mass extinction that we are experiencing now is, is probably quite fundamentally from just straightforward habitat destruction in the first instance and then climate change in the second instance. What's left of the natural world, temperature of climate change is occurring so fast that basically, you know, biodiversity cannot adapt quick enough. Is it lost? Is it all gone? Well, not necessarily. I think we've, uh, it's difficult to get a handle on, on time frames with all of this. Um, but there would seem to be some sort of agreement between, you know, the sort of environmental activists and you know your scientists that tipping points are around the corner tipping points are quite close now and a tipping point is a threshold a threshold of which you cross and then a natural system breaks down and then it takes thousands tens of thousands of years maybe for uh if even if left alone for it to return to its 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 equilibrium that it had before and this is you know, for example, uh, could easily be your Gulf Stream, for example, that brings, you know, the trade winds and the, and, and the flows across the, the oceans, um, which determines the seasons and, and the rainfall patterns. And uh, all of those sort of things can switch, can turn. And as a result of that, then obviously the biodiversity that's evolved to adapt to a certain seasonal pattern or a certain rainfall pattern will simply not be able, will, will certainly not have that element to its lifestyle that it needs for reproduction, for example. You know, tipping points are very worrying and some say it's 10 years away, some say it's 15 years away, some say it's 20 years away, depending on who you talk to. However, they all seem to agree that these tipping points are fairly close now. And I never thought that I would see this in my lifetime. I thought it'd be my daughter who would experience all of this, but it would appear not. It would appear that in my lifetime, in our lifetime, if we do not address this and do not change this, we will see these tipping points arriving. And what happens after that is an unknown quantity because we simply don't know because it's never happened before. But it cannot be a good thing uh, because it will change natural systems that control weather, seasons, flows, and the plants and the animals cannot adapt to that quick enough. So we will see mass extinction even accelerating and, and off off the scale that we're seeing now unless we do something to address this unless we use our awareness our knowledge our technologies um, our education to slow this down and to try and reverse it when you talk about tipping points what are some of the major tipping points that can jeopardize wildlife in in africa specifically well a tipping point um would be something like the weather so the seasons the wet season the dry season and they're all in a way though everything in nature everything is connected so what happens in your north and south pole what happens with the melting of the glaciers it affects the oceans the oceans affect the currents the currents affect you know the winds the winds affect the moisture and the flow of moisture and this affects the seasons and the seasons obviously you know affect whether it's going to be dry or whether it's going to be wet you know where we are in the uk we have the four seasons in in, in africa you generally have a sort of wet season and a dry season although you might get a, a shorter rainy season and a longer rainy season occurring but i mean it's these it's these climatic patterns it's these weather patterns uh when they change when they shift then the natural order the dynamic equilibrium that we see that exists all around us changes. That means that life cycles and breeding cycles all change as well. And that means that your plants and your animals cannot reproduce in the same efficiency, in the same functionality. And simply it must might be just too hot or too cold. I mean, there's also the temperature element to all of that as well. So the tipping points are when th these natural orders these natural systems change do you think the human race will survive these mass extinction or let me let me rephrase do you think the human race itself will survive once nature has been compromised i think that depends if we don't blow ourselves up with nuclear weapons in the, in the, in the short term but um i imagine the human race is probably heading towards some planet or something to start a new uh, colony on, on on one of those and I think that will certainly happen. I think that will definitely happen. 
if we don't destroy ourselves in the uh, in, in in the short term. Um, I think. If we arrive or if we hit that tipping point and that mass extinction and, and uh, you'll see a you'll see a, a, a huge amount of death um, in the, within the human race as well because of the reliance on the natural world which then isn't there uh, or can't can't provide um, so it could be quite apocalyptic in that sense I mean hopefully we will have the sense not to arrive at that point and we'll avert it. Um, will the human race survive overall? Yes, probably in some form or another. Um, some small pockets here and there. Um, but that's very apocalyptic. I mean, I like to think of a positive future as well, or an optimistic future, that we will have the sense not to, not to, to avert that, even if it's at the last minute. Um, I hope that that's you know that's what we'll do but i mean the human race will at, at some point i'm sure colonize another planet as well and uh, carry on in some form or another in this final chapter i asked dr bayless what positive steps we can all take to support the fight for the planet if you've enjoyed this episode take a moment to subscribe and keep in touch chapter five hope So given how dire the situation seems to be, is there something that we can do that we're not doing at this stage? Because it, it seems like we have the technology, we have the answers, in some cases we have the resources. What's stopping society or governments from taking the actions to save these species and ecosystems? Yeah, good question. Um, there's many factors at play here. Um, obviously, power, control, money, all of those are, are playing huge elements in the in the overall picture and also i think maybe the the acceptance that this is actually happening the understanding and the belief that we are at this stage and this is the situation and there's a whole group as a whole um lobby of people who don't believe this, this is happening and don't believe climate change or global warming is is a problem at the moment I think often when I when I listen to these sort of debates, uh, people talk about climate change and and and, they, and people say it's a natural phenomenon. What are we talking about? And they're correct. It is a natural phenomenon. The Earth has always heated up and cooled down, and it's cyclical. And this is normal, and this is natural. What is not normal and not natural about what is happening now is the actual speed at which it's happening. So this is where the global warming side of it comes into it. Um, and literally in the last hundred years, basically when the Earth heats up and cools down in through climate change and it's cyclical, it happens over thousands and thousands of years. What we're seeing at the moment is uh, a heating of the Earth that's happening in the last hundred years. It's the speed at which it's happening which is the problem. Climate change is a natural phenomena, but that's not the point. The point is that's the speed at which it's happening. And if you just step back and think about it, just take an objective look at this. We have an exponential number of people, 8 billion I think it is now, and increasing. We are at the same time destroying huge areas of natural resources and, and indeed rainforests that clear the air, clean the air, govern the air, control the balance between oxygen and CO2. And we've got a massive increase in industry and people, as I said. If you remove the process that, that are involved in cleaning the atmosphere and governing the atmosphere, then of course it's going to make a difference. And at the same time, that's coupled with an increase in industry and in vehicles and pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Then, uh, then, then that dynamic will affect um, the atmosphere. You don't need to be a scientist. You don't need to be, you know, you don't even necessarily have to have all of the facts and figures. It, objectively, just have, a, just have a think about it. I mean, it's obvious that this is going to make a difference and it's going to change things. I mean, and that's where we are. And, and like I said, it's the speed at which it's happening, which is the problem. The natural world is just not able to evolve fast enough to adapt, to, to survive in, that, in that, this, this far, very fastly changing environment, which is why it's being known as the Anthropocene or the, uh, is it the eighth mass extinction. A mass extinction is something that, that happens quickly. But this is the pattern that we're seeing now. And it is it is being driven by by our species. Are we optimistic? Are we pessimistic? I, I like to try and remain optimistic, even though you know um, I'm involved directly with conservation, and we lose more fights than we win, but we do win some, and we do 
have some success. So my understanding and take on this whole situation at the moment is we just got to try and hold on to as much as we can in the short term on the belief that in the longer term things will be different and uh, the awareness, the technology, the uh, interaction between our species and the natural world, although we're actually part of the natural world, this dynamic that we have will be different and we'll have a more sustainable interaction uh, and we won't be dependent necessarily on, on direct resource extraction um, and we will have uh, more sustainable alternatives that can also generate the power that we need and, and, and put the food on the table that we, we eat without you know destroying vast areas of the natural world. I'm hopeful that you know technology can also you know come in here as well considering our, our species is is, is I, th I view our species as the most creative and the most destructive species that's ever walked this earth you know on one hand we can destroy everything and we're very destructive look at the wars and the fighting and you know and that what we've done to the natural world on the other hand you know we we have an amazing ability to create incredible technologies that can change the world very quickly and make people's lives different very quickly you know i'm not just talking about things like space exploration but you know even looking at mobile phones and everything else like that we have an ability to create incredible technology and then i'm optimistic that we can maybe use some of these technological creations to certainly address the balance of co2 and oxygen in the atmosphere um, but also provide sustainable alternatives so that people don't necessarily have to take directly from the natural resources. And this is already happening. We don't have to necessarily run um, our machines on fossil fuels. And I think that technology has arrived. So it's just a matter of time now of fine tuning it and getting it more efficient and getting it more mainstream. And I think it's all happening. So I am also seeing great positives. So it really is, from my side, uh, a race against time now um, in terms of how we can use all of this to halt and reverse and stop this decline in enough time before we reach these tipping points and these events of mass extinction, which doesn't give us very long, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years maximum maybe. We will see. Um, but I still like to remain relatively optimistic um, Time will tell. Do you think it's actually possible to reverse the extinction of certain species or replant forests that have been cut down for their hardwoods? I think it's certainly possible to replant forests and a lot of that work is already happening. Um, it's all about the seed bank. It's all about having the right seeds for, that represent the natural forest and even even you know even if you've got a patch of forest you you can use that to sort of grow out from uh you've got to be a bit careful you don't start planting forests where where there weren't any forests for example um i mean you you need to take some of the earlier satellite maps or some of the earlier aerial pho pho photographs i mean gra a grassland community is also a natural climax community depending on the soil and and the terrain and and the, and the and the and the and the geology so you don't really want you don't want to go planting trees where there weren't trees but certainly plant trees where the where the where the trees were and were cut down and then it's all about the type of trees it's not just as simple as planting a tree you got to plant the right species of tree if you're trying to replant a natural area then it's got to represent the the trees of that natural community that were there before um, which is where the seed bank comes in, very important. And a lot of that work is already happening now. And you, you're finding and a lot of this is linked to the carbon market and the voluntary carbon market and carbon offsetting. Where um, And this can also form quite nicely some sort of livelihood for local communities surrounding an area where they can get some sort of revenue for replanting uh, through, the, through the sort of carbon offsetting or the carbon, carbon market. However... That has to be carefully managed and carefully audited because there is a lot of fake carbon marketing. Um, in terms of bringing back species that have become extinct, no, I think I think once they're gone, they're gone. You might have their DNA, I don't know, maybe, maybe in a hundred odd years you might be able to recreate it, but it wouldn't be the same anyway. 
those species became extinct because their habitats were they were either overexploited for something that, that that they they possessed like a skin or their meat or even their eggs or they were they became extinct because their habitat was destroyed and if their habitat's gone it's it's a, it's a whole debate whether or not there's the, there's a value in bringing back something that's extinct but at this stage i don't think it's that possible anyway it might be possible in the future um, we've got to, in the short term, just stop any more destruction and any more extinctions and have an optimistic view that, you know, in the longer term, um, we will arrive at a state where we will be able to, you know, we won't have to destroy and we won't have to make things extinct and we will live sustainably with the environment. And that's really, you know, where where we need to head to. And that's that's the vision we have to have for the future. Fundamentally, would you agree that it's our own lifestyles it's our own choices that is ultimately causing the destruction of these natural habitats uh yes i think that is very much the case we can there's a lot of we can do there's a lot of there's a roles we can play uh in terms of our lifestyles and i but i think you know the environmental movement the lobbying movement uh, the protest movement is trying to just get the messages up to the government so the government make these decisions as well you know so i mean the, the use of single use plastic uh, i believe now is about to be banned in the uk or something like that I heard, that's what i heard you know not not before time i can't believe that single use plastic is still being used in this in this planet in this world why can't plastic be why can't most or all plastics be recyclable i mean why why is single use plastic even allowed what you're seeing in in certain african countries like tanzania and i think kenya is they've banned plastic bags if you go to a supermarket or something like that they're all recycled paper bags uh which is great i mean you're seeing african countries leading the way here uh when when here we are in the uk and and you know you go and make a meal and you just have a small mountain of plastic at the end of it it'd be great if the supermarkets could play a leading role here and you know have biodegradable plastic bags i know some of them do and even have sort of brown you know recycled paper bags for for their fruit and their veg and stuff that you didn't need to use plastic bags for so much that is happening to a certain extent but i think it could happen a lot more what's your advice to younger people today who want to participate in the rejuvenation of the planet and these ecosystems like people like myself who don't have a background in conservation but want to somehow help or play a part other things that that we can do well I, i think for the younger generation certainly follow follow your passion follow an interest follow follow your heart uh if you want to get involved with conservation see what the options are get in touch with conservation organizations uh have a look and see what projects are happening what the what are they are doing and how are they are doing it and talk to people involved in conservation of how they got there what they did what they studied where they went it's all possible follow your passion if that's what you really want to do then you will do it you don't do this for obviously for financial gain um so there it it's a it's a path that's long and winding um but eventually you will get there um and you can make a difference there are many elements and and uh, of of getting involved in conservation and 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 having a love for natural history and a magic for nature um some of the sometimes you know when you if you have success in conservation it's very re- rewarding like i was saying before you seem to lose more battles than you win but sometimes you you do win and you do protect a place um and all the all the effort and the work becomes worthwhile uh for example the creating of a new protected area at mount marbu uh through a community conservation approach is is wonderful and that's going to be that's really heartening and then there's the magic of nature as well it's not just i mean the conservation and the saving is 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 the point of it but if you have a love for nature you have a love for the magic of nature and you get to see some some wonders of nature that are, that are, that nobody else may never you know maybe nobody else has ever seen so for example i was one of the um i was bat netting on a on a montane forest on a mount lemulian northern mozambique and i was on my own and put my bat nets up 
and you put them up for um, for dusk and you open them just after dusk. So I was next to this montane stream, I was in this twisted bit of um, montane rainforest dripping with epiphytes, dripping with algae and oh, sorry, moss and lichens. And uh, I sat down, it just got dark, I opened up my net and then the whole forest descended into darkness and I listened for the bats. And I sat down on this, this piece of mossy ground next to a stream and then the whole of the ground around me lit up in this phosphorescent fungi and I was sat in this bed of white fluorescent fungi all the way around me and then about a hundred fireflies came out along the stream and were dancing around me so I sat in this white bed of phosphorescent fungi with all these magical fireflies dancing around me and it was the most incredible experience of magic and awe and wonder of, of the natural world. And it's things like those experiences that, you know, you also take away and drives you to a, a greater, higher commitment as well in terms of conservation and protecting areas. Uh, and if possible, support conservation organizations, if possible, support, you know, green technology um, and put your, your voice to petitions, put your voice to protest uh, let the government know that uh, you want them to have a more environmentally sustainable uh, approach. Do you feel like there's a there's like a Gaia or an Earth spirit that manages and maintains and renews? Yeah, I do actually. So as an energy, so I, I guess everything is different forms of energy when you, when you strip it down to basic physics. And there's a flow of energy. One uh, energy will, will move from one form to another. And if you take that basic concept and you apply that to the natural world, then you, you can say there's a, there is a, a flow of energy, a life force of energy. And there's a recycling. That, you know, Everything in nature is essentially recycled when we live, when we die, when we breathe. It's what is known as a dynamic equilibrium um, in the sense that uh, it's a changing, you know, it's in balance. It's, it's a changing balance, if you like. I, I feel very strongly if I go to a patch or uh, a piece of undisturbed forest, there's something about forest which always gets me. I always feel it inside and a tingling and a, and a spiritual feeling. It is a spiritual feeling. Uh, it's, it's a spiritual feeling to be on top of a mountain, to be deep in the forest, to be surrounded by nature in its purest form, in its, you know, nature in its undisturbed form, nature in, in the form that that evolution has arrived at in that moment of time um, through simply connectivity and, uh, and everything having its niche and its place. And so, you know, what happens to this animal, what, what that does or that plant affects this one and affects that one. And that all, you know, the reproduction life cycle of this plant or animal is connected to the reproduction life cycle of, of this plant or this animal and everything is connected. In a place like a wet forest or a rainforest, they say it contains 70% of terrestrial life on Earth, 70% of all living organisms on terrestrial Earth are found in these rainforest areas. And so it's buzzing with life. And you feel that life energy when you're deep inside a patch of primary undisturbed rainforest. You can feel that energy. And you feel that inside you. And it's a very spiritual feeling. It's just so intense and so alive. Um, that That's a very special feeling. And uh, when we disturb that, then, you know... We disturb it at our peril and the dynamic equilibrium is lost or changed and out pops things like zoonotic diseases or, you know, we, we, we cross tipping points, natural ecosystem uh, tipping points and and everything changes and we, we arrive at a, you know, a state of mass extinction. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Climate Story. Take a moment to follow us on YouTube at Climate Story, Instagram at Climate Story Official, and wherever you consume your podcasts. Climate Story is produced in London, and I'm Rishad Mehta, the creator and your host. Thanks again for listening. See you on the next one.